All right, here we are again. This is Outside the Box, our EMS podcast to drive clinical performance in the city of Sugarland. Kevin, host today, we are talking about strokes. So I'm really pleased to have with me one of our own paramedics coming out of the field to talk about the way we manage strokes, identify strokes, and some of the other nuances that go around it. So I'm glad to have Jake Varner with me to talk about those strokes. Varner, how about you, you introduce you? How, tell us how long you've been with Sugarland, how long you've been in the industry. Uh, just a quick little rundown about you. All right, a little quick synopsis. So like Chief Leverance said, uh, my name is Jake Varner. I am a firefighter paramedic here at Sugarland. I have been at Sugarland for seven years. I've been in the in industry for seven years. Uh, came right out of high school, dove in head first. Um, a small stint at a rural place for a few years um, while I was doing this. So I had both the rural EMS and urban EMS. Um, so I was able to see it from all sides. Um, other than that, I'm just, just cruising. Nice. All right. So you feel good? Ready? Ready to talk about strokes? I'm, I'm as ready as I'm going to be. Talk about some strokes <laughs> here, right? Okay. So let's look back seven years coming out of school, even the year of school. So maybe, you know, seven, eight years Has has stroke care as a pre-hospital provider changed now compared to to when you came through school what are some of those differences that you've noticed in that time i feel that it's just always changing i feel like tomorrow is going to be something different from today um but you know seven eight years ago uh it was just recognize early and then get them to the hospital quickly there wasn't really a big uh need or indication for which hospital it was just a hospital as fast as possible um now it's the different kinds of strokes different kinds of hospitals that can handle those strokes and uh early notification to those hospitals are the biggest things um i i feel like if i could look back at my 19 year old self i would shake him a little bit and say soak up a little bit more knowledge um but overall i feel like i'm a little bit more advanced than i was seven or eight years ago Still have a long way to go, but I feel like I know a little bit more than I did. Yeah, so even to, to emphasize that point, these these changes that you had mentioned a little bit are all very recent. That I look back at when I started, and it was very similar. That it was, here's your Cincinnati stroke scale. Yeah. Call it a stroke. Go to the hospital. Yeah. And we had hospitals. We had trauma centers. And this is, you know, uh, for those who don't know, me growing up in Chicagoland, newer to Texas. So it's not even just a, a regional thing. We had trauma centers and we had hospitals. That's really kind of how we went. And you pick out a stroke, you call the hospital, say, hey, we're bringing you a stroke. And that's kind of that. You go to the hospital. And we got a little bit better that we started making stroke centers. So then it was deciding between the community hospital or the stroke hospital. Great. So we got a step in the right direction. And that wasn't all that long ago even. That was maybe six or seven years ago when that started to become a thing that I can recall. Um, but not right. Comprehensive stroke centers, primary stroke centers, large vessel occlusions, medium vessel occlusions. But man, we're going to dive into all this fun <laughs> stuff. But uh, stroke care has evolved. It seems like it's evolved pretty far. But we're talking like year, like a couple of years, mm -hmm. not not a lot of time. So, um, but what are what are some things that you were taught then that still hold true today? So. Then um, it was definitely early notification and, um, you know, your assessments. So Cincinnati Stroke, um, that was the preferred back then. And it's still being taught now that that's, you know, kind of the primary that you dive into first to see if, yes, you are having a stroke or you're not having a stroke. Um, but even in, in the rural setting, uh, um, when I had started, it was the early assessment, early notification, and then go to which there was one hospital and that whole hour area around. Um, so that was the primary stroke area, but it was the early notification, early transport to that mm. place because you had an hour transport. Yeah. Even down in the urban setting, um, when I first started here, it was pretty much the same, um, which now our comprehensive center was our primary, the whole as a region, it was either that or downtown. Yeah. So, um, those are about the same as, as now, but you know, like you said earlier, there's tons of differences just within the past couple of years. Right. So, and really, uh, you know, as we dive through this, let's, let's not act like 
we're not incredibly blessed as an area, as an oh, agency absolutely. when it comes to stroke care, right? Like we are talking about uh, two hospitals with comprehensive stroke capabilities um, within a stone's throw, mm-hmm. one right in the middle of our city. We got another primary stroke center on the edge of the city. We got another one just a little bit further outside the city, one a little bit further than that. I mean, we have six different transport destinations for for strokes, for crying out loud. So it might just seem easy that why do we need to really worry about which hospital we go to if they're all fabulous with stroke care, but we're going to we're going to dive into that. So uh, we're going to talk about a few research studies while we're in here, too, which we'll have linked up that you can peruse yourself as we reference them. But one of them seems like a really basic one. The first one we talked about when we were discussing this, Jake, is that time matters. And, uh, you know, we joke about, you know, you can you can use research to prove anything. Right. (laughs) But ultimately, like time's important. But when we talk about time, this first research study, um, it talks not about the time to the hospital or necessarily seen time, but our time to that uh, reperfusion time. And it's hard for us because how how much inter how much interaction do you have after you do this patient care between this reperfusion time as a field provider very little right. it, it's majority of it's not, uh you know seeing that it is an actual stroke getting them to a proper designation and then after that it pretty much transfers over to that authority right and we we don't often talk about it. it's becoming better in ems i think the hospitals talk with us a little bit more we get better feedback than we used to but we just don't see it mm-hmm. right it's just not something in our mind that our our mind kind of stops at patient transfer right but the reperfusion time really that's our 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 key that we want to go to the onset of symptoms to that reperfusion time you know that's why we're always emphasizing that uh, last known well time to kind of narrow that down so when we talk about this, this onset to reperfusion time, there's our window we're playing in, but we only get to manage a piece of it, which becomes kind of a challenge. And I think we had talked about this before when I brought up the expression, the, the first five minutes of a fire determines the next five hours. Had you heard that before? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. So tell me your interpretation of that. What, what does that mean to you? So... Little, little left field. It's kind of like the butterfly effect. Like what you do right now in this moment is going to change everything throughout the course of, of the next steps. So um, in this situation from here on out, what you dive into right now is, is essentially how that person is going to um, deal with whatever issue they have. Right. So I, I like the idea of the first five minutes in the five hours routine. I'm going to go a little bit further. I'm going to make our challenge, our kind of our stroke slogan, if you will, that the 10 minutes, because we talk about 10 minutes a lot in scene times and dream times, we have 10 minutes to determine the next 10 or more years of this person's life, right? That we can have that lasting of impact, talking about the butterfly effect and how we didn't seem like a whole lot, but man, that's going to really amplify further down the road. So this is just the same kind of uh, idea that, Ma'am, we need to take the steps up front early, the right steps, the right direction, because um, otherwise we got to come back and start correcting those steps. And this is most definitely a, if you don't have time to do it right, you must have time to do it twice situation. And we do not have time to do it twice. Like there's, right. there's no gimmies yeah. when it comes to the stroke care. So, um, all right. So let's talk back. You had mentioned the Cincinnati stroke scale. Love it. I love the Cincinnati stroke scale. Uh, I'm going to talk about some literature about it, but why don't you give us a quick rundown on the components of the Cincinnati Stroke Scale and what it really means to us? So it, for us, it's it's very validated. It's very simple, very quick, effective, easy to use. Um, it's, in my opinion, um, when you have those good assessments and those good Cincinnati Stroke Scales, it it makes the rest of the call very fluid. It makes it easy, really easy. Um, the, the slurred speech, the arm drift, the facial droop, those are very easily observed. And so you don't have to dive very long into trying to figure out, yes, this is a stroke. No, it's not a stroke. If you had to put a time frame on this exam, how long do you think uh, it typically would take you to do a good one? A good one you could probably get done in two minutes. 
Man, I think you're being generous. Yeah, I will. <laughs> so, uh, how much of this is done before you even touch this patient, right? Like you're coming oh, at least, across the room. At and, least two thirds of it. So, uh, some of the things that you said about it that I love it. It is. It is. It's still a mainstay for all the things you said. Like it's it's stood the test of time. It is challenged. It is uh, has passed these challenges. It's validated. It's um, we talk about researching things. We talk about sensitivity and specificity and those fancy statistical words are telling us how likely it is our yes is accurate and how likely our no is accurate. So we're a little less accurate when we say this is not a stroke based on Cincinnati stroke scale, but about 80% 80 of the time, a yes on Cincinnati stroke scale is a stroke. So, I mean, like that's pretty good. Pretty good odds. Like you know, that's not even like... It's at least a B. That's true. I was going to say, it's not even C's get <laughs> yeah. degrees, right? So it's an incredibly sensitive test. It has weathered the storm. There's piles of, of stroke exams now, but there's a, a, a big limitation of the Cincinnati stroke scale. It's really, a, it's a binary yes or no question. Yes stroke, no stroke, right? Which when we go back seven years, it was fine. Mm -hmm. when it was stroke hospital, not stroke hospital, right. uh, worried about a stroke, not worried about a stroke. Right. Um, so it's a phenomenal, phenomenal tool of it, but man, right. Kind of limited, which hands us, lends us into the next evolution of things. Um, so why don't we, let's get into the next evolution of things, right? So let's talk about large vessel occlusions. Elvos is kind of a nice stroke buzzword these days. Tell us, tell us some things about elvos. Jake, what do you got for you? So elvo, LVO, large vessel occlusion. Essentially it's a, it's a block in one of the brain's main vessels. Um, much higher rates of mortality and disability in LVOs or elvos, large vessel occlusions versus non, um, because of the size of the vessel being, uh, occluded. Um, and I'm sure you're going to get into this, but the primary versus comprehensive stroke centers that that is the new, you know, from not stroke to stroke is now, okay, this is a stroke. Now, is it primary or comprehensive? Um, nice. Very nice. And, and to help us segue into the next point, how do we evaluate for elbow strokes here in Sugar Land? I'm glad you asked. We use the LAMS score. I love <laughs> LAMS scoring. LAMS is probably one of like eight assessments for a large vessel occlusion. Again, we'll link these research articles into it. There's some reasons we went with lambs. Remember what we did before lambs? I honestly do not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, race. The race score had been a pretty popular one. Um, and actually lambs came up in a discussion with one of our local hospitals in pursuit of their comprehensive status. Um, the Los Angeles motor, motor score um, is just so easy. Right, so our components of this are our uh, grip strength, arm drift, and facial droop. Well, that's starting to sound a little familiar there, right? <laughs> so we went with LAMS as an organization because of the ease of use, how simple it would be that if I'm already coming in and I'm gonna look for facial droop, slurred speech, and arm drift, now I just add in this grip strength at the same time, right? Versus race, I can't even remember what race is I used race for a couple of years and I, yeah, right? we, we were taught it and yeah, it's gone. <laughs> it, it's a, a whole additional scale. Instead, we took Cincinnati stroke scale, we mashed it up with lambs and really we just have a four component kind of sugar Mega, land stroke yeah. assessment now. Right. Um, so what's great though, is that lambs compares really nicely to the NIH stroke scale, which if you have not seen an NIH stroke scale, it's probably about a three page assessment. But this is what the neurology team does in the hospital to determine how people are doing. They do it at three months, nine months, all these time periods to see how things are happening. Time consuming, cumbersome, not going to happen in the field. Don't worry. You're not doing a three page stroke assessment. But the LAM scores is very closely related to that. It's very similar to um, the long term outcomes based on the score. So um, are there things you want to tell us about performing a LAMS assessment, Jake? I would love to. All right. So the biggest, so like you said, they're very, very similar. The, the biggest difference though, is it, it's the evaluation of the severity. It's not a yes or no. Um, it helps enable your clinical decisions, where you're going to go, where you're going to do things like that. Um, as far as what you're looking for, you have a face droop, uh, arm drift, grip strength, 
and it's the face droops zero to one. It's either yes, you have it, no, you don't. The arm drift, um, you don't have it. It's, you know, one of them kind of, or the other one just drops. And then for the grip strength, it's the same thing. Zero to two, zero is being no, one is, it's a little weak, and then two is absolutely none. Um, and then, like I said, that kind of helps enable your clinical decision-making versus, oh, yes, stroke, no stroke. Yeah. So we'll talk about how we take that score, but right to reiterate how easy this exam is, either there is perfect grip strength, there is absolutely no grip strength, or there's something in between. Right. Zero, one, or two, right? So um, the thing to emphasize with this is that this does not have to be some like ironclad, you are locked into this LAM score, God help you if this is a number off. <laughs> That's not what this is, right? This is to give us an idea, um, right? And we're using it talk about elbows, but you've alluded to this a couple times with destination decisions that a comprehensive stroke center can do the thrombectomies, can get these elbows or MVOs, the medium vessel occlusions is now like the new exciting thing that's just coming out. They can handle those at a comprehensive stroke center. Primary cannot, but there's other stroke cases that need to be at the comprehensive stroke center that aren't less large vessel occlusions or medium vessel occlusions. And those are just your severe strokes, right? Like highest level stroke care, worst strokes there are, man, we need to get them to the right place. So um, you want to talk about some of our our scoring in this, in a LAM score, and like with some of our thresholds for transport decisions? Yeah, so if you have a, a LAMs of zero, but you're still slightly suspicious, yes, it is a stroke, you're you know, more than okay going to a primary. Um, they can absolutely handle that. Here in Sugarland, we have the uh, four scale. So anything four or higher, go to a comprehensive. That's not a decision. I know it's uh, a big, the in-betweens. Um, just err on the side of caution because it may not be showing now, but it could. Um, it could grow, go into a large vessel. Um, so any anything really, if you have a slight suspicion i would just go to a comprehensive um but either way i would definitely go to a stroke center <laughs> yeah i agree right so so positive findings on a cincinnati stroke scale you're going to a stroke center land score of four or five you're going to a comprehensive stroke center but a land score of zero one two three acceptable at a primary stroke center primaries can handle it but just keep that in the here's, back of your mind. <laughs> here's the kicker, though. What if we get a patient that is having a LAM score of one, has the the obvious signs, started 30 minutes ago, we got a really good solid last known well time, meets the criteria for primary stroke center, but the hospital they want to go to is a comprehensive stroke center. Lucky for them, the comprehensive can handle it. <laughs> right? So the difference is that the comprehensive stroke center isn't just all services, none services. We call them and we tell them, here's our findings. Here's the LAM score. It's a two. Their neurology team, the interventional neurology team, is going to respond appropriately. It's not all resources or no resources. They're going to respond like a primary stroke center because they can, right? So it works out that way that a comprehensive stroke center in the middle of our city is going to get an awful lot of non-comprehensive stroke center patients. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fine. We need to let them know that this isn't a comprehensive level stroke patient so they can respond appropriately and not tax resources excessively, right? The thing about taking a, uh, a twisted ankle that's going to need some care to level one trauma right. and the whole trauma team responds because it's a trauma, mm -hmm. right? So there's there's the difference. We're really good about the trauma. All this stroke stuff is, is becoming a new thing, not even for us, for the hospitals, like seeing the comprehensive stroke center development and and where we're going with it is, is pretty fun to watch. So, excellent. So what else, what other thoughts do you have about, about the LAM scoring? Any, any sorts of other thoughts about LAM scoring? So, the, just another big, you know, asterisk is the, the Cincinnati is a yes, no. The LAMs is the comprehensive, like, how elevated it is. Um, it's not necessarily a yes, no. Um, you know, like you said here, we mash them together to get just one big mega report, <laughs> but, um, both of them together can be done within two minutes, <laughs> two minutes. 
<laughs> right? And those are the time frames we're going for is that we want this stroke identified in less than 10 minutes. That's a very generous amount of time to, I mean. It if, is a lot of time. <laughs> guys, if it's taking you 10 minutes to worry about a stroke, then, I mean, there's some other compounding factors in there, but I hope we walk in for somebody with some neurological changes and you're picking up on neurological changes pretty quickly. That's a, a generous amount of time for 10 minutes, but then it's another 10 minutes to tell the hospital. So that's another good, generous time frame. But 20 minutes, man, like 20 minutes. Uh, I want, I want yeah. my brain breathing for 20 minutes. So um, that's the goal of these, of these short time frames. I want you to put, if you're worried about a stroke, what I'm telling you is I want you to put a stroke assessment ahead of this full set of baseline vitals, right? If yeah. you get the ability to pick out a stroke, you take 30, 45, 60, 120 seconds to, to nail down this stroke and get a good read on it, man, is that going to be so much more valuable than, no, their pulse ox was hey, 98%, hey. right? So priorities here, okay? Um, and really, we should be doing this kind of stroke assessment on anybody with neurological changes. You get some squirrely altered mental status, throw a stroke exam on there, right? Um, and like some of the state stuff you said here, can we have a LAMP score of zero and still have a stroke? Absolutely. Right? So remember, there's four criteria, only three in the Cincinnati, and uh, some of them overlap in the LAMP. So there we are with one hanging out there. If we get that slurred speech, but no motor deficits, there's a zero LAMP score with positive Cincinnati stroke skill findings, yeah. right? So um, also don't be hesitant to call it a stroke. If some obscure findings are in there and you're like, man, it's not a clear cut exam, go with that cautionary side, right? We don't have the scanners, right? The physicians have better tools. Uh, they got more training on it. It's better to have a false positive on a stroke alert than to have missed a stroke. Right. Absolutely. So uh, that's kind of been my fun little punchline is it's bad enough to have a stroke. It's, it's worse to miss one and, and not get it on your assessment. So um, quick assessment, practice the assessments, make it happen fast. And pretty quickly, we should be moving through that stuff. Right. As like you said earlier, I mean, we're really good at traumas. So, I mean, in traumas, you're treating life threats first, which surprise, a stroke is a life threat. <laughs> so like you said, those assessments should be repetitious should be pretty good at them don't take long at all so yeah. treat your life threats first and then our next step is tell them the hospital right see something say something sorry that's a tsa line not a sugar land line but if we we see this findings we've got to tell somebody right i mean it's a practice that we've had is announcing it on the radio i got a stroke alert i got a STEMI alert mm -hmm. dispatch doesn't do anything with that information it's it's neat it's just a muscle memory it, notes. <laughs> yeah. it is right um, it would be great if we could get that to prompt some other action, but we're going to go in a different direction for giving our notifications. Uh, no secret that we use Pulsera. We have phone calls. Um, why don't you tell us about notifying the hospital? What are, what are some challenges? What are some, uh, especially as we, we adjust some of our methods, tell us about from a field provider perspective, alerting the hospital. So for years and years, at least here, it was the phone call. You know, you, there's the red phone in the ER, they're gonna pick it up and you tell them what you got. Hey, this is a stroke alert. Okay, and then you dive in. You can, you know, you have your hands free, you can put it on speakerphone and, you know, start IVs, do those things as you're rolling to the hospital. That is super easy if you're across the street from a local comprehensive stroke center. Um, but in the same token, Pulsera, you're going to have, at least in Sugarland, you're going to have an engine or a truck respond with you. So you have the extra personnel. Give them the pulse era. Tell them, hey, this is your only job right now. Fill this out with whatever information. So for us, it would be name, date of birth, the anticoagulants, and last known well. Send that in. It takes well, five minutes max. If you're actively looking for the information, if you already have the information, it takes two minutes. Two minutes is kind of like my time like stamp. Minutes, I do like man. two minutes. Okay, two minutes. <laughs> um, I'm not done in two minutes. You, you can get a lot done in two minutes. Um, but yeah, it, it, it takes two minutes. Uh, somebody on enough, a different apparatus can do it without really any deep training. It's mm -hmm. just typing on a phone. Um, and then it notifies the hospital. And I was telling earlier, we had a call. We did the Pulsera and had the hospital notified before the medic unit had 
arrived at the patient. So they knew what the medic unit was bringing before they even saw him. Yeah. So super early notification. It's really great. The challenge is the time constraint. Um, if you like need your hands and you're across the street from the hospital, it's a little bit difficult, but so is calling. Yeah. So is radio. So some thoughts with this that our, our goal is to let the hospital know as early as we can because we want the specialized team, right? Um, so I'm, I'm with you. I'm not going to act like it's not easier to pick up the phone and make a quick phone call, right. put it on speaker. I, I got it. Right. <laughs> I'm with you. I got it. But I'm going to keep pushing you to use Pulsera, and that's going to be the expectation. And there's a few reasons why. Mr. Varner, when you have a stroke, what, what physician do you ultimately want to have there to take care of you? <laughs> the best one. <laughs> right. Of what specialty? whatever my ailment is <laughs> right so we want the neurology team to be in this stroke case if i make a phone call somebody at the other end answers the phone and that may be the only person that knows what's going on yeah. with what i'm bringing hopefully they've told someone i think we've all encountered something where we show up and we still surprise people hold a wall <laughs> right so what pulsera does is it has a, a distribution list on it it's not one person getting it uh Typically now, you call the emergency department on the phone, say, hey, stroke alert. They say, hey, that sounds like a really bad stroke. They start enacting some processes to make a stroke alert happen, but they're still the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. They have to take this next step of action. When we send a Pulsera alert, we put it in as a stroke alert. It goes to the ED, so the ED knows we're coming, a couple people in the ED, but then it also goes to the neurology team. The neurology team doesn't have to wait for a delayed phone call. There's no getting distracted of, let me put this phone down, homie, something walked at me and now I'm distracted. It takes this human factor out. So if what we're going for is reducing the time from onset to reperfusion, we need the person who's going to do the reperfusion to get there sooner. That's the goal of the early notification. Now, so some really good benefits, and I tell you that context so you can appreciate the time investment that right. comes with putting an impulse there. I got it. It takes some time, takes some extra minutes. The more you do it, the more fluid it becomes. Very fluid. Right. There's also a lot of benefit to putting the stroke scale in Pulsera in that notification. We adjusted it so the first one on your drop down menu is your LAM score. So you can just type in there. Uh, you don't even have to calculate it. You pull up Pulsera and it'll tell you which numbers to push based mm -hmm. on findings. So we tried to make it as easy as we can and minimize the information so we can get the notification. If the alternative is make a phone call or no notification to the hospital, make make your phone call. Yeah. If it is this two minute thing, let's get going. If it is our patient needs our hands, make a phone call. I'm still gonna wonder what circumstances went into it. I'm gonna ask you about it. I've heard some crews are worried I might ask why. I'm gonna ask why anyway, guys. Just make decisions. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm gonna ask why, okay? So we need to let this hospital know because we need to get that ball rolling. We know the hospitals are busy. You're gonna hold the wall. So we need the hospital to clear the space for this patient. So they they got to have a couple minutes to do that. Otherwise, we're going to be standing around, okay? Because, um, again, our, our main objective in all this is reducing the time to the intervention, is reducing the time to that reperfusion. And that goes to our, our new goal here is that it's no longer acceptable to save a life anymore. We're, we're going for lifestyles. And minimizing this time, these minutes that add up to hours, that amount of time can make the difference between this uh, grandparent being able to sit on the couch and watch the kids play or get on the floor and play with them or being able to feed themselves in a stroke case. Like this is these are, are pretty crucial things that until we haven't had them, I think we kind of take them for granted that I can just chew food and swallow it. No problem. Right. So um, I didn't fully appreciate my grandmother's stroke when I was in high school and haven't had food cut and prepared for her. And now that I get to kind of look back at that with a different perspective, I think, man, like what an opportunity we have to preserve that kind of lifestyle. Like that's, it, it's one thing to keep somebody with a heartbeat great, but when somebody's cognitively intact and they have their motor functions and they get to live at least some of the life that they had before because of the things we did, I think that's pretty freaking awesome, honestly. So, um, Time frames. Time frames matter. Identifying early, notifying early, transporting early. Let's talk about transporting <laughs> early. Um, how do you get to the hospital faster, Mr. Runner? 
I would say get out of the environment faster. Oh, I love that one. Do not drive faster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Risk is going to love me for saying it. Do not drive yeah. faster to get there sooner. Leave earlier. Okay. With that comes a big paradigm shift. Here it comes. Of all the research we're going to link and all the research we use to come up with some of our questions in our discussion, I could not find the evidence that says staying on scene to start IVs and strokes improves outcomes. Can't find it. Can't find it. I mean, it's got to be there because that's <laughs> what we do, right? No. Identify your stroke. Get a quick assessment. If your patient's stable enough for it, leave. Leave. Right? Take all the hands you need. Start IVs on the way. Yeah, they're going to want an IV when you get there, right? If we can get them one, great. If we can't, it is what it is. Adding time on scene is to that patient's detriment, though. So identify it. Tell somebody prepare our patient for transport rapidly and get out of there rapidly and do more things on the way. What are your thoughts in that, that realm there? Absolutely. I mean, the end all goal, like you said, is not the life. The life is kind of very broad subject. It's the lifestyle. So if what they need is the whatever destination's intervention, then that's going to save their lifestyle. So get them out of the environment, do the IV, whatever else they need in route and get them to that definitive care. I like it. And one last note, um, we have an option for blood control, I'm sorry, blood pressure management that we have labetalol in our set of medications. And don't worry, I'm not going to throw this at you. This is the one we discussed, but this is a good point as we're talking about strokes. I've used it a few times. <laughs> so when we deal with strokes that are hypertensive, we get a little worried about it. But we have a challenge of differentiating that from a hemorrhagic stroke or an ischemic stroke. So if it's an ischemic stroke, we have a clot blocking perfusion past that clot, right? So that hypertension is a compensatory mechanism. The body's trying to shove perfusion past that clot. That's what makes labetalol a poor choice in a suspected stroke. That if we're worried about a stroke with hypertension, there's that opportunity for being ischemic because of this clot. And when we reduce the pressure that the body's producing to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure, we're actually going to cut off the blood flow and cause more damage to the brain, right? So if you'll notice in the guidelines, it'll say that under hypertensive crisis, when it's talking about labetalol, that that guideline is not intended for stroke management. And that is why. That's a, it's a valid question to look at and understand why I can have a blood pressure of 230 over 140, and it's fine to give labetalol, but if I think it's a stroke and they're presenting with stroke symptoms, oh my Probably hold off. <laughs> yeah. Right? So um, those, those are some of the key points to take with you. So Cincinnati Stroke Scale, tag on the grip strength gives you our Sugarland Stroke Assessment, <laughs> which, by the way, uh, the Houston Methodist System loves that we made our own. So way to be creative, guys. We're, we're, we're trailblazing right there. So identify it, notify somebody. And get going, right? Any other closing thoughts you have for us, Jake? Just keep it simple. I mean, that's the easiest easiest way to do it. The tests do not take long. Get them out of the environment. Notify the hospital. In, all, in, in your years, have you... Has there ever really been stroke-specific therapy that we can deliver as pre-hospital providers? High-flow diesel. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I don't see it changing. I don't see us having stroke specific interventions. We'll have our supportive interventions with yeah. ventilations and airway. And uh, if we need some type of fluid resuscitation somehow that it's messing with hemodynamics that much, we're not getting TPA in the field. No, no, we don't. We don't have the scanners too dangerous. No. Right. Um, and in fact, uh, TPA is on its way out. There is a new clap busting medication. You'll hear more about it. KX the late um, whole lot better outcomes coming out of KX late than TPA. And actually we're seeing some of these time frames start to extend a little bit because of a new evolution of medication. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for the time today. Thanks for having me. So hopefully you enjoyed our first episode here and we look forward to having you back for more in the future. Thank you.